Okay, in this lecture, I'm going to explain how we can add animation and graphics uh, to your web pages. So I'm going to talk about CSS animation, talk about canvas, and scalable vector graphics. And these are all different ways in which you can dynamically change um, the contents of your web page in an animation kind of way. Right, so I'm going to start with CSS animation. So there's two kind of standard ways of using JavaScript for animation. One, we can change the CSS, HTML, and so on using document object models. So standard stuff, we can you know, reposition things. If we've positioned a div in an absolute way, we can then move that div around uh, by controlling its top and left, right, bottom properties. Um, or we can do use the HTML5 canvas. So that provides a nice way in which you can put a canvas on the page and then just draw on the canvas by changing the colors of pixels on the canvas. So two different ways of doing it. I'm going to cover both. So with CSS, as we explained sort of quite a long time ago, um, you, can position HTML, you can position HTML elements such as images at an exact place on the page. And then we can change that position uh, by manipulating the CSS uh, with JavaScript. So if we want to do that, we can change the CSS style property. Each element has this style property, um, and this style property is itself an object that contains all of the different CSS properties. So you just have to access that style property to get and set the CSS styles. So here, for example, we're getting a reference to a paragraph that has the ID my paragraph, and if we do myparagraph.style.color, we can change the color of that paragraph to red. In an earlier lecture, I sort of mentioned timers as well, but if you want to do animation, um, what we need to do is um, set the position of the element and, and then change that position uh, um, at a specified time interval. So animation is just like a film, really. You have the element at one position, and then a little bit later you move it a little bit, then you move it a little bit, move it a little bit, and you do that at regular intervals, and that produces the illusion of movement in that element. And we use two, two different JavaScript functions for this. We can either use set timeout, which will execute the function once after the specified interval. So we call set timeout, specify the function we want to execute and the interval after, and how long we want to wait before we execute that function in milliseconds. Or for animation, more often use set interval, where we say we want to execute this function every, as an interval, repeatedly execute that function um, with an interval between the execution um, specified in milliseconds there. So it will, it will repeatedly execute the function after the interval and continue to do so until we tell it to stop. We can cancel timers um, if we store a reference to them. So, and then we can call clear interval to cancel interval timer or clear timer to cancel a timeout timer. So if we've got an interval timer here, we do kind of set interval. Um, so when we call set, in, uh, set interval um, to start the timer, this will return a reference to the timer and we can use that reference um, to stop the timer by calling clear interval here, and the same with the timeout timer. If we call set timeout, that will return a reference to the timer, and if we want to prevent it from happening anymore, then we can just call clear timeout to stop the timer. So let's have a little simple animation example. So here we've got a, I'll do a demo, and then I'm going to work through how it actually works. So let's, let's do a little demo. Um, so first demo is here. Not particularly exciting, um, but you kind of get the general idea. So we've got a square um, that's being animated, and it's sort of we're basically drawing the square, and it, we're drawing the square here, and then changing its position um, at, a, at an interval uh, that we specify when we set up the timer. So this is our first animation example, and I'll just now explain how that actually works. So we've got a div here. So we did all this kind of div with uh, position absolute. Uh, background color red, we're giving it a width and a height. So we're just creating a div on the page uh, there. Then we've got the setting an interval timer, and this interval timer is calling the move square function um, every 100 milliseconds. So here's the move square function, and what we have here is a variable position, which is initially set to zero. We're adding 10 to the position here every time this function is called. If the position is greater than 500, we're resetting it to naught. So this is stop it going off the edge of the page. So it's going to keep going across the page here. And then when it reaches 500, it's going to be reset to zero here. So, it's, so this is what gets this kind of like going across the page and then resets the beginning of the page. And then when we've set the position correctly, 
Um, we obtain access, we get a reference to, the, to this div here, the square div as the ID square. And we set the style, um, get access the style object and the left property of the style object. And we set that equal to the position uh, plus picks because you have to use picks when you're setting the top, left, bottom, and right properties. So here we're setting the position of the, the left gap, the gap between the edge of the div and the edge of the page um, equal to the position. And we're increasing that position every time interval so that it appears to move across the page. I thought I'd give you a slightly more sophisticated uh, game based on this idea. So the, this is much of a game, really. I mean, we can watch it. We can guess when it's going to flick back, but it's not that, not that thrilling. So I thought, let's have the splat the rat game. So this is not a real rat, by the way. It's just a, it's just a you know, fake rat. And the idea is you drop the fake rat uh, at the top of the tube, and you have to guess um, when the rat's going to come out um, and then sort of hit, try and hit it as it emerges from the tube. So it's sort of typical kind of fairground game. You, know, you might argue that it encourages you know, barbarity towards rats, um, but that's possibly another, another issue. Um, so let's have a little demo, and then I'll show you an example of that in JavaScript. And by the way, um, all of these demos I'm giving you, I've got a sort of source code. The source code for that's available on the course website, so you can download the source code, see how these are implemented, and, ex and use that as a starting point for implementing your own games. So let's, uh, let's have a look at this Spat the Rat game. Uh, uh, where it is, there we go, Wacker Rats. Um, so here we have, uh, sorry about the resolution, two buttons. We've got a drop rat button, which will start the rat falling into the tube. And then we've got a whack rat, which will make the baseball bat appear at the bottom of the tube. And if we click the whack rat button when the rat is there, then I can hit the rat. I made it deliberately easy just for demonstration purposes. So we call it drop rat, and the rat sort of falls to the tube, and at a certain point it kind of emerges at the bottom of the tube. So refresh the page. Uh, let's try and hit it there. And if we call whack rat, it makes the baseball bat appear. And if the baseball bat appears when, when, the, brat, when the rat's not there, it gives me a bit of feedback saying, you missed. Let's try again. Uh, it's called drop rat. And this time, I'll call whack rat. And this time, I've hit the rat good and proper. And it tells me I've hit the rat. So that's what this, uh, that's what this game does. Sort of loose recreation of the fairground game. Um, and so what we got here, we got, uh, I'm not going to go through every piece of code because um, you've got it on the, um, you can download it from the course website, but just very quickly, we've got um, the style and we're controlling, um, yeah, okay, so we've got the, we've got the rat here, um, which is an image source rat. I've given an ID rat and it gives it a class animate, which means it's got this, uh, this set of CSS properties being applied to that. And then we've got the pipe, which is just a div um, class pipe. So just to I put it at a certain place on the page, giving it width and height and background kind of black and so on. And then we've got the whacker, which is this image of a bat, um, which is inside a div um, with the ID whacker. So the image of the bat is inside a div with the ID whacker, so I can make it appear and disappear. There's many different ways of doing this kind of stuff, right? And then we've got the actual code, um, which I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but when we click on the button that drops the rat, it basically um, Oh yeah, we've got a position variable. Um, it sets it to 50, um, sets up some of the stars or whatever. And then we've got a move rat function that does exactly the same as that red square does. Um, you saw the red square moving across the canvas. So the move rat is just increasing the position um, and, and until it increases, until it hits the bottom of the page. And they've got whack rat, which basically makes the bat visible and invisible. Um, there's a star property called visibility. It can make it visible or hidden. So it's basically dropping the rat, animating it in just the same way as the red square. And then when you click on the whack rat button, it will make the bat appear. And we'll do some simple calculations to, make, to see if the bat is covering the rat um, at the time that you click the button. So that's um, a little bit of an introduction to how you can animate things using JavaScript and uh, use JavaScript. A little bit of an introduction to how you can use JavaScript uh, to change CSS and do animation by changing CSS and JavaScript. Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of other ways of drawing with HTML5 and JavaScript. Really going to focus on Canvas, but I'm going to mention a little bit about scalar vector graphics as well. 
So Canvas is, um, so with CSS, it's a bit like, um, well, it's not really like that. It's a bit like, it's a little bit like Inkscape in the sense of or vector graphics, even though we've got vector graphics here, in the sense that it's uh, scalable, however big or small, the HTML element's always the same. Whereas a Canvas, you're sort of saying, I want something this number of pixels across, this number of pixels down, and then what you're doing is you're basically drawing by coloring the pixels in different colors. That's how Canvas works. So, so in this case, we just create a canvas with the HTML5 element canvas. We can give it an ID, we can give it a width and height. So this is how many pixels the canvas is gonna be wide. This is how many pixels the canvas is gonna be high. And we can apply styling properties so we can give it a border. In this case, I'm giving it like one pixels solid black border to it. So with this very simple example, we can create a blank canvas. And if you look at it in the browser, we can see it um, because we put a border around it. And so it's 600 pixels wide by 200 pixels high. And then we can draw on that canvas by changing the colors of those pixels, and um, it can do some event handling as well. So let's draw on the canvas now. So we've created the HTML5 canvas element in just the way I've explained. And now we can, do, we can draw a rectangle when the window loads. So we, when the window unload, we'll call, we'll call the draw rectangle function. And what this will do is gets a reference to the canvas, document get element by ID, seen this a million times, gives a reference to the my canvas uh, HTML element. Then what we need to do is get a reference to the context of the canvas. Each, can each canvas has a drawing context. You can probably draw in 3D, I've never tried it, but you generally get the context of 2D if you're doing two dimensional drawings. And we use this context as a bunch of methods for drawing on the canvas. So in this case, you've got a fill rect method, which we're using to draw a canvas um, at position draw a rectangle, sorry, at position 10, 10, and the canvas, the rectangle width is 100, and the rectangle height is 100. So if we call that, we're drawing, we've got 10, 10, that's the, that's the coordinates where the rectangle will start, and then we're, saying we, then we're saying that we want a rectangle that's 100 pixels wide by 100 pixels high. And the coordinates always start in the top left-hand corner. It's not like a standard graph or something like that. So this is 0, 0, that's 10, 10. This is 0, Sorry, this is 10, this is what, this is like 110 uh, naught. So the X goes along here and the Y goes along down there. So we get the context. The context has the methods for drawing on the canvas. That's how it works. Now we can use mouse events to control what happens on the canvas. And the, to do that, we can use this event object and the event object contains the X and Y coordinates uh, about where the mouse is at any particular point in time. So here's a little example of that. So I think I'm going to come back to the I'm going to come back to the code. So let's just demonstrate what it does. Uh, so let's just show you what it does. So so here's the canvas. Now as I move over the canvas, I'm listening for events, and wherever the mouse is, I'm drawing uh, a blue rectangle in this case. So I hope you can see that there. Yeah. So as I move the mouse. It's getting the mouse position and drawing a blue rectangle under the under where the mouse is at that particular point in time. So you know your game could be a drawing application, you know some kind of painting thing if you wanted, you know if you want to take take this whole stuff a little further. So here's how it works. So again, we're drawing. We've got a border around our canvas. Let's just get back to the original source code to start with. So we've got our canvas here, HTML element of canvas has a certain width and height, same as the previous examples. Then we're getting a reference to this canvas here. And what we've got here is canvas on mouse move event. And that will call this function called the draw rectangle. So whenever uh, a mouse moves over the canvas, um, it's gonna call this draw rectangle function. Draw rectangle function has an argument, which is the event that triggered this function. Um, and the event has this very handy stuff uh, client X and client Y, and these are the X and Y coordinates of the mouse. So when the mouse, when you move a mouse over the, over the canvas, it triggers this on mouse move function event, which is handled by draw rectangle, and out of this event, we can pull the X and Y coordinates of the mouse, which I'm storing as variables here. And now I can use my context um, to draw a rectangle at the position of the mouse by specifying the mouse X position, the mouse Y position as the place where I want to draw the rectangle. In this case, the rectangle has a width and height of 10 pixels. Now, if I want to animate on the canvas, I have to have this sort of double process. Because as you saw in the mouse move example, the canvas stays, stores the pixels 
you're just sort of changing the colors of the pictures on the pixels on the canvas, and those pixels just stay there forever as long as the page isn't refreshed, right? Once I've changed the color of the canvas, the, the color stays there. So if you want to animate something, um, and if I don't want the thing to sort of leave a sort of weird trail of itself, I have to clear the canvas and then draw the object at a different location. So I draw the object at one place, and then a little bit later, I clear the canvas completely and draw the canvas, draw the object at a, at a slightly different position. And by drawing, clearing, drawing, clearing, drawing, I can make the object appear to move across the canvas. So here's a little example. Um, I'll give a demo first, and then I'll go through the go through the code. Again, you know, all this source code is available if you want to have a look at it. So here's my little example. So what I've got is, uh, I'm, this is a canvas again, but in this case I'm animating this little face, and I'm sort of drawing the face at one point, clearing the canvas, drawing it at another point, and in that way, by doing that, you know, 10 times a second, I'm making it appear to move across the canvas. So let's have a little look about how that works. So we've got a set interval. Um, so this is our interval timer. So I'm going to call the animate method, uh, animate function, every 100 milliseconds in this case. And what's this going to do? We have an xpos, which is the same as that uh, earlier example I had where we have a position. So xpos is the position where I want to draw the face. And each time I call this function, I increase xpos by 10. Or if it's gone beyond 500, I, I set it back to zero, so the face sort of flicks back when it reaches the edge of the page back to the beginning. I could have made it go back and forth, but for simplicity, it just resets it to zero. This animate function, once it's set X passed correctly, will clear the canvas. This is this kind of wiping of the canvas thing, and then it would call a function that draws a face um, at a particular position. That's an error, by the way. It shouldn't be calling any arguments there, because it doesn't have any arguments there. So, you know, some kind of, you know, Slight mistake there, not non-deliberate in this case. So, the clear canvas function is very easy. All we do is we draw a, a white rectangle um, that fills the entire canvas. That's all the clear canvas is doing. And then the draw face is doing, you know, fiddly stuff, drawing some rectangles, and then it's drawing, um, you know, changing the, drawing like the, the eyes and the nose and the mouth by drawing like, different rectangles with different colors. That's what it's doing. So in the case of your games, if you're doing a Space Invader or something, you could um, draw a, a rocket um, by doing this kind of fiddly stuff in a, in a single function um, that draws the rocket. The easier way would probably be to create the rocket in Inkscape or something like that, save it as a picture, and save it as an image, and then you can also use the context to draw an image on the canvas. And that's probably the easier way of doing it. And you have to fiddle around with making it rotate, and there's a bunch of stuff to making all this work, but roughly speaking, that's what you could do. And you could do a very simple game. You could do a very simple version of Whack a Rat, right? You can have a, a sort of splat game when you had to hit the tomatoes or something like that, and make the tomatoes move across the canvas. Whenever you click on the canvas, you could use the kind of mouse handling stuff to determine whether the mouse click coincided with the tomato, and then you could draw the tomato being splattered and give the user a point or something like that. So I'm imagining um, that this is the right, that this is the sort of approach you'll be using to produce your games in Coursework One. Um, or the CSS approach is also fine. I'm not being prescriptive here, but I'm going to say a little bit about scalar vector graphics, which is also supported in HTML. So with scalar vector graphics, um, this is a way in which you specify graphics um, using XML. And scalar vector graphics is um, Inkscape, which we talked about in the second lecture, I think, is a scalar vector graphics editor, right? It's a, so, you, so you specify um, like circles and squares and whatever, you know, using the scalar vector, vector graphic format, uh, and then uh, browsers and things like Inkscape will then ren render those scalar vector graphics. Um, and as I explained previously, scalar vector graphics are scalable. You can zoom right in on them, and they never become blocky or low resolution. Whereas if you look at the canvas at high resolution, you could, you'll be able to see the pixels. Now, you spec specify scalar vector graphics using XML. The thing about XML is you have to have closing tags for everything. So even if it's a single element, you always have to close the tag with a slash, uh, with a slash before the, the uh, closing brace. If, if it, but if it's got an opening and a closing tag, then, the, then you don't have to bother with that. So in this case, because there's only a single tag, so we've got SVG, opening tag, SVG, closing tag. Um, if this had a, in this, so, that, so that's fine. We don't have to worry about the, close, the slash at the end. But here we have a circle, which is just a single tag. 
And in XML, you have to finish that with a slash to draw the circle as shown in the bottom right corner. So you can use scalar vector graphics to draw, draw lots of different things. Um, increasingly complex. If you wanted to, you could possibly use Inkscape to create a scalar vector graphics uh, specification XML, save it, um, and then copy the XML, the SVG XML from the Inkscape file into your HTML file. I'd like to be a bit messy, but if you have a little look, so this is the, my Inkscape file, and this contains a, the rectangle in SVG format. So if I could, I could fish out this, this rectangle um, from the SVG file and include that in my website if I wanted to. So I could potentially create something quite complex in Inkscape and uh, copy the SVG specification of it from Inkscape and put it into my HTML. I'm not saying it's necessarily a good idea, um, but it's a possible idea. And so roughly speaking, um, these are the differences SVG and Canvas. So SVG, as I said, doesn't have these resolution problems. It has support for event handlers. Now, I've never tried this myself, but I, I imagine um, what that means is that you could attach events to parts of the SVG, right? With the Canvas, obviously it has event handlers for the Canvas as a whole, but it doesn't have it, uh, event handlers for the parts or the pixels on the Canvas, right? You have to do all that by judging where the mouse is, getting the mouse position, and then determining whether your object is underneath the mouse or get, maybe you can get the color or something like that. So it does have some support for event handlers, not strictly true, um, but SVG probably has much finer grained event handlers. Um, so Canvas is poor text rendering capability, it's totally true, um, but it's kind of fast because there's no sort of history stored in the, in the Canvas in the sense you just write some, change the colors of the pixels and that's it. Um, whereas SVG, once it gets really complex, if you want to change that complex structure rapidly to do animation and stuff, it's probably not ideal. So probably you're best off sticking to the Canvas, but I thought it's worth just mentioning the SVG stuff just in case it's interesting. So um, headfirst HTML5 programming, the uh, course book, has a bunch of stuff on how to use the canvas and do animation on the canvas. Again, there'll be some useful examples you can work through if you want to get to grips with this stuff. So this lecture, um, all about how you can add animation and graphics to your web pages. So I think you've got pretty much all you need for your game website now, right? You've got uh, uh, the HTML, you've got the CSS, you've got the um, PHP, and I've given you a number of lectures now on how you can uh, do the registration login, how you can do the canvas, so you can create a game that creates a score. You can now st store those scores inside data structure, inside local storage, which you can use to generate the rankings page and all the login and uh, registration functionality I've given you as well. So I think you're good to go, ready to go, finish off your coursework. Um, and in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about some libraries and frameworks that can make it easier to build websites. So things like Bootstrap, jQuery, some of the third-party libraries um, that I'm not saying you not even necessarily recommending you use for your coursework, but it's certainly well worth being aware of them if you're going to move into web development.